it's really exciting to be here. Those of you who have known us and worked uh, with our group for a while know that we used to have um, patient uh, um, get-togethers get on a, an annual basis. We started out uh, having just disease-specific meetings, and when we got up to having five or, or, or so of those a year, realized that we really needed to be more efficient and have some that, that brought everybody together so we could talk about common themes and common goals, common opportunities. And so we started doing that, and then COVID hit, and so everything kind of changed. So this is our first time back together. I'd love to set up something where we're doing this on an annual basis, getting together with updates. So we'd love to hear feedback on what works, what doesn't work, what you're interested in, where we'd like to see this go. But it's, it's, it's an amazing time in the, in the field. So first off, thanks for being here. I think you know, that's, that is in and of itself an important move. Being here is part of what we need to do. We need to integrate, we need to be working together. Uh, clinicians, investigators, pharmaceutical companies, patient organizations, and the patient and uh, parent and family community have to all be working together. So Maddie Stepanek and I are kind of uh, thinking along the same lines on that. It's really a matter of teamwork. We really have to uh, be doing this in an organized way. So being here is really part of the deal. I don't know if you realize it, but there is an absolute revolution going on in neuromuscular disease now. It is phenomenal what is changing. This is, if, if you look historically back at when these disorders were first identified, that was sometimes 150, 200 years ago. And gradually there's been this increase in understanding and knowledge and, and we've been witnessing this, this improvement. And now it's just exploding uh, because finally it's coming full circle and we're able to take care of, of these disorders in a much, much more fundamental way. And so that's what I wanted to convey to you today is that we are at the beginning. We are not at the end. We are at the very beginning of this revolution in terms of neuromuscular disease understanding and control. And all of that depends on us again forming this teamwork. It, it's, gotta, it's gotta be that way. If, without that, we can't. I guarantee you there will be no new treatments unless the patient community invests in it and wants it to happen and moves it forward. Um, if, if we can't just sit back and wait for some brilliant scientist to come up with this and then think that it's going to be in, at your drugstore uh, you know, for you to pick up because it just doesn't work like that. We have to be uh, working with the pharmaceutical companies to move this all forward. So that's really what I wanted to convey today. And um, Marissa uh, went over the, the schedule today. Uh, the way we envisioned this is that we would have a few talks in the morning that are relevant to everybody. So you might think that you don't have a genetic disorder. Maybe you have myasthenia gravis. And what I'm here to say is that ultimately, even understanding and being able to control genetics is gonna have an impact on diseases other than the obvious genetic ones. Because it's all part of a picture. It's all part of this overall complex design. Same thing if you have, if you have a genetic disorder, you might think you don't need to understand antibodies and immunologic attacks. I don't believe that's true. I think they're all integrated. And exercise is important to everybody, but we're also really thrilled uh, that Chris Jones is here and giving us some broader perspective on what we're dealing with and where we're going, because I think that's gonna be essential. So that's, this morning we'll go through that, and then uh, you'll get a little bit of respite and, and some fuel, and then we'll break into, into different groups. We organized that so that everybody would have a group that pertained to them. So if you don't see your specific disorder that you're thinking of on that list, talk to us and we can let you know a, a group that we think would be uh, uh, relevant to you where you could learn what's going on. And, and there you'll have an opportunity to talk with experts and really ask specific questions and try to understand where things are, what we understand now, and where we're pointed in the future. So it's all very, very excited. And then the, the cherry on the, on the top of the day, basically, is we'll come back together after those breakout sessions 
and talked with the drug development people. To me, this is, this is where the rubber really hits the road, is that we're going to find out where things are, what we're developing, and what the future holds uh, for, for the future. I tell you, it is phenomenally excited. I, I, literally, I, I'm talking about it, and the hair's literally standing up on the back of my neck, because I just find this just amazing. I mean, I've been doing this now for a few years, and um, I can tell you that I've never seen excitement and momentum the way it is. So that'll be the end of the day. We'll discuss kind of where things are at and where they're going. So again, it takes, it takes a village. I've already kind of mentioned that, but just to make the point, we've involved speakers from a number of different institutions. So I don't want this viewed as just a Stanford event. This is a Northern California event, and really it's a much broader event than even that. We, we're eager to integrate this with, with our collaborators, but certainly at the other premier institutions around here, at uh, UCSF and at um, UC Davis. We also invited the people from uh, California Pacific uh, Medical Center. They have phenomenal investigators and clinicians there as well. Unfortunately, they were out of town and not able to participate. But um, we really want this to be not just an institutional effort, but a broad, broad effort uh, that, that, again, incorporates everybody. In the past, when we had these patient meetings, we'd get a lot of people also coming into us from the Kaiser system. And we welcome you. We really want to get people that are not getting care at any of those institutions. Uh, because again, we, we do view this as important. And in our trials, we will frequently want to involve uh, people from Kaiser that maybe aren't seen at any of the academic institutions, but are eager to participate with us in the in the uh, trials and in our uh, work to understand these disorders. And I know that's true of the Muscular Dystrophy Association as well, that they want to uh, connect up uh, across sites, not just uh, the, the named ones. So we have speakers uh, from all over, and then we're obviously doing this with the MDA. The MDA is a big umbrella organization that covers all of these different neuromuscular disorders. We used to say there were 47, but I mean, they're, they're way more than that. There are hundreds and hundreds now that we, we focus on and uh, view this as, as really an important group. But when we were setting it up, we, we talked directly with the MDA about how we don't want it to be just that one organization either. We want to involve other patient uh, organizations. And so there are representatives here from a number of different disease-specific patient organizations. And again, we want to do this in an integrated fashion. We view that as critical. And uh, we, we strongly recommend your, your working with uh, the MDA, obviously, but also with a disease-specific organization, because we think that only by, by, again, hitting this in all ways can we do as much as we can as fast as we can. So I think that that's a lot of what's going on. And then this business about integrating it with the, the pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical uh, uh, companies is another really important issue. And this is one where you know I get slapped on the wrist frequently by people one floor above us here in this building because they don't want us to, to get too tight with uh, uh, the biopharmaceutical companies uh, because they, they view that as somehow I don't know, uh, in conflict to the pure, pure approach of academia. I couldn't disagree more. I think it's really important that we know what's going on uh, with the exciting research being done uh, in pharmaceutical companies so that we can learn from them, they can learn from us, and again, we can do this in an integrated fashion. So we've reached out, we, we at Stanford uh, try to work with as many companies as possible. So that's kind of laying the groundwork for what I hope we accomplish today. It's important to realize that when we talk about research, and we're going to be talking about research, that I also don't divorce research from clinical care. To me, they are integrated. We have to do this. We have to do both. We have to be taking excellent care of patients in order to see whether or not something new really is helpful. And so we have a huge team. So at Stanford, that is our clinical care team. We have care teams on the pediatric side, on the adult side, and they're all trying to do their best to take care of, of patients in, in a, as uh, thorough a way as possible. And then we integrate that 
with our clinical research team. Our clinical research team is also quite substantial. And again, that's the way the, that's the, way the game is played. This isn't um, you know, unnecessary, this is critical. Uh, you'll also be hearing from Dr. Tina Duong, who heads our, our division of, of outcome measure research and development, uh, who will talk about exercise today, but she's also around to talk about novel approaches that we're taking in terms of being able to investigate these disorders and understand them as thoroughly as possible. Okay, so just in, in a few minutes, oh, I've spent all my time on the intro, so I've got like five minutes to talk about genetics. But first off, what are neuromuscular disorders? The, the term itself can be confusing to people. What it means to us in neurology is that these are disorders that involve the nerves that come out of the spinal cord and go to muscle or the muscles themselves. So they involve the nerves or the muscles or both. Okay, so that's what neuromuscular disorders are. It doesn't mean they're limited to that. It means that they, those are things that are affected, but they can affect all kinds of other things. So some people have a neuromuscular disorder that also affects their intestines or also affects their heart or affects their eyes or their brain or different things. And we view that as part of our, our role if we're gonna treat people that have a disorder of nerves and muscles, we have to treat the whole person. And so a lot of what we do is integrated uh, throughout uh, these issues that come up. And that can include many of these named disorders that you've heard of. So ALS, Friedreich's ataxia, spinal muscular atrophy, neuropathies, myopathies, neuromuscular junction disorders, these are all in that neuromuscular family, we're gonna be a, a aware of and trying to uh, understand and control all of these. One of my favorite slides, it, I think I showed it every talk I ever gave, is this one, uh, because it really kind of shows, shows the neuromuscular end of things. So, I don't know, do I have a, so that is a motor neuron. That is the one cell in the spinal cord that controls muscle. And that one motor neuron in this rat goes to all of the white muscle fibers so that you can see this amplification. One cell here controls in the, in the calf of this rat hundreds or in humans thousands of muscle fibers. There's a huge amplification from one nerve cell controlling thousands of muscle fibers. And you can begin to understand what we care about. The diseases that we're talking about were identified back in the 1900s. Can I have my phone just so I have some sense of, of time? <laughs> and um, and uh, over time, we got to understand the anatomy better so that the anatomy got much clearer. So this is a muscle fiber uh, that is showing the beautiful nature of muscle. It's very, very crystal-like uh, and uh, quite beautiful to look at. And this is a nerve going to it and controlling it. So the black here is, is where the nerve activates the muscle. And here you can see everything. So this is uh, a muscle looking at it in a different way. And here you can see that where the neuromuscular junction is, where the nerve activates the muscle, and this little white twig here is the nerve itself. So if you have a form of nerve disease, Charcot-Marie tooth, you might be missing this nerve so your muscles don't work because you've lost the nerve input to it. If you have myasthenia gravis, this connection might be altered so that it doesn't, it doesn't activate the muscle. Or if you have a muscular dystrophy or a myopathy, you affect that muscle so that it doesn't work right. So that's the that's what we're dealing with. So that just paints the picture and gives you a, a landmark idea of where we're at, what we're dealing with. But then what we want to talk about is what causes neuromuscular diseases. And one thing we know that can cause is, is inflammation. So you can get inflammation of any of those different areas, the nerve, the neuromuscular junction, or the muscle. Interestingly enough, that was not understood until about the 1960s. I had a, a, one of my friends in middle school 
had an inflammatory muscle disease, and we did not know that that's what he had. He could have been treated with steroids. Steroids were around, but nobody knew that that would, be treat, uh, that would treat his disorder. And, and so it wasn't that long ago that we understood the role of something as simple as steroids. The most, the, one of the richest people, Aristotle Onassis, does anybody remember that name? I mean, do you know why you remember him? because he married Jack, Jackie Kennedy. But he himself was phenomenally rich. He was, a, he was a Greek shipping magnate, and he died of myasthenia gravis in the 1960s. I mean, that tells you something. You could have all the money in the world, and something as, as simple as steroids was not known to be useful for that disorder. So at any rate, that was one of the earliest advances in understanding and being able to treat neuromuscular diseases. Back in the same era, we began to understand what we now term are metabolic disorders. These were discovered by people looking under the microscope and biochemists who could identify different proteins, and they understood that you could have disorders of muscle metabolism. They couldn't generate energy. And this led to some very important insights that you could treat some people just by changing the food that they eat, ate or you know, give them, giving them different, different things that allowed them to kind of circumvent their problems with metabolism. And then uh, genetics came along and started to be used to understand this. So it was in 1951 that, that Watson and Crick published their little paper on, on how DNA was structured. And then it was in the 60s that we began to understand a little bit about uh, genetics and how that actually impacted everything. So again, it might seem like a, a million years ago to some of you youngsters, but it really hasn't been that many decades that we've been uh, uh, trying to figure this out. And the, all of those things interact. So that's the thrust of today is to, is to talk about how these things are interactive. And I'm just gonna mention a little bit about uh, the genetics, and then I'll get off the stage. So part of the issue in figuring out the genetics is uh, that we can look at it and we can see the chromosomes. As you know, every cell in your body has this group of 23 different pairs of chromosomes. And, um, and so that gives us a hint. So someplace in there, we have to find it. Well, if we look at one chromosome, we can see that's made up of DNA and a whole lot of different DNA all encoded with these, these, you know, this is that Watson and Crick double helix, and it's all made up with these four, four letters, just C and G and A and T make up that entire stretch. So how do you find that genetic abnormality? It's really not obvious and, and was a real puzzle. And the very first gene that was identified not because somebody figured out, out you know, what would cause that, but just, I don't know what does it, but it's gonna cause a disease. That was actually Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And that was identified in 1986, published in 1987, that they, they, what they did is they said, well, it looks like it's on the X chromosome, so, it's, so we can identify it somewhere. And then they'd look at a bunch of other people and they'd say, well, it's on this region of the X chromosome and this region and this region. They finally narrowed it down. There was only one gene left. Nobody had ever heard of that gene before. It was a new gene. Nobody ever knew what that was, but it caused Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And that method of being able to identify genes like that changed the world it, because now we could do that over and over and over again. And that led to this, that was, these were the papers that came out in 1987 uh, discovering that, but it's led to hundreds and hundreds of different diseases. And this is in part because nerve and muscle disorders are things that we can be very, very precise in terms of understanding. So now we, we have hundreds of named nerve disorders, hundreds of named muscle disorders, and we're working to understand just what the genetics uh, are that cause it. I, for one, thought that Duchenne was gonna be the easiest one for us to treat, so it took me a while to go beyond that. But part of the problem is that in muscle, you don't just have one nucleus, you have multiple nuclei. And so if you're gonna fix a muscle, you have to fix every one of those muscle nuclei. 
And that's, that's tough. Well, that means that we have to have a method that's very efficient. And so that was part of the reason that this was a bigger challenge. And so some of us gradually realized that this other disorder might be a better place to start. It's a little easier, and it comes back to that picture I showed you before, where if we can fix one nerve cell, it's going to affect hundreds or thousands of muscle fibers and make them work better. And so this was the idea of attacking uh, spinal muscular atrophy, which is a disease. So again, I'm just going to whisk through this in the interest of time uh, to remind you how genes work. So finally, we found the gene that causes spinal muscular atrophy. That was in 1995 and uh, began to understand how it worked. And largely, this comes about because that, of that DNA that has a bunch of different genes on a chromosome, but each gene is actually broken up into different pieces. So they're, they're, each gene has a different, it's like you have a recipe for an entire recipe for a protein, but each recipe has different paragraphs. And so that you can stretch this out and so when we, we create this, the, 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 the working copy of the gene is in RNA, and, and it takes that whole recipe, and then you can put it together in different ways. And so you can, you can splice it together. You can put all the paragraphs together, or you might just pick two or three of the paragraphs and put those together. So this is part of, the, of what's going on in your cell. It's trying to come up with these different versions of this same recipe to make a protein. It's really quite cool. And then that's all happening in the nucleus of every single cell, and then it generates the protein. So how do we control that? And this, is, this led to this, this insight of what's called uh, antisense. So again, the DNA is expressed in RNA, and it turns out that if you make a so-called antisense, you can synthesize a version of this which should show up. Ah. Well, it's doing its own thing here. At any rate, we'll skip ahead so that um, we'll, we'll look at, isn't that curious? OK, now it went backwards. OK, so you can synthesize this antisense. So this is a synthetic. And it's worth remembering this because this we're going to use a lot. This is called an antisense oligonucleotide or an ASO. And the value of it is that it sticks to one site and one site only in all of the hundreds of thousands of RNA molecules in every cell. It's just going to stick wherever you tell it to. It won't, it won't stick anyplace else. And so the value of that when we are looking at this is that we could stick it to one spot and it'll change, it will be able to control then how that gene gets spliced. We'll be able to control which of those paragraphs of that recipe come together. It gives us con some control that we didn't have before. It's very, very cool. And so that leads to this idea of SMA. So in SMA, everybody with spinal muscular atrophy is missing one gene. That's the SMN1 gene. So one way of treating this is we can give you that, a new copy of that gene. So that's cool. It turns out, though, that they also have a second gene. The SMN2 gene makes the identical recipe for a protein, but it's got a flaw in it so that it oftentimes is missing one of those paragraphs. So it's often missing paragraph seven. And if you miss paragraph seven, you don't get much protein out of it. And so these smart people at Ionis Pharmaceuticals came up with a compound called nusinersen that sticks right by chapter seven and forces chapter seven to be included in the recipe. So now you get, this second copy of the gene, everybody with SMA is missing the SMN1 gene, but they have this other copy there as well that just doesn't work very well. But now, if you take Spinraza, it forces that gene to be included, that, that paragraph to be included. 
And so then it works. It's really remarkable. So the other approach was working with Novartis. This is, this is reprogramming a virus that takes the, a new gene in. So right within years of each other, we came up with these two new treatments for SMA. And it never gets old to look at these. So this is the very first baby that was treated with nusinersen. And here she is now. So she would have died within months of that first video. But now with nusinersen, her SMN2 gene is making, making the, the uh, SMN protein and she survived. And this is the first baby that was treated with Zolgensma. Um, so Jerry Mandel at Nationwide had developed the treatment that became Zolgensma and treated some uh, babies at Nationwide in Ohio. But then they had to commercialize this. And the first one to receive the commercial form is this baby. And you can see she is already quite weak at three months of age. And then she got treated. And here she is 18 months after treatment. The value of doing this in SMA was that the results were going to be so black and white. Whenever you do a clinical trial, the drug might fail the trial, or the trial might fail the drug. If you don't design the trial right, you get these equivocal results out. And you've all seen some of this, where we're arguing with, with each other about whether it works or doesn't work. In SMA, there's no question that that worked. And that was the reason for doing it there. It was a very black and white response. If a trial fails, there are about 10,000 different reasons why it might have failed. If a trial works, all 10,000 of those things had to have worked. So we know that each of these types of treatment now work, and it's opened up for us to use those methods in all neuromuscular disorders. So that's what I wanted to relate to you, is that it's a really exciting time. We are able to use our understanding of genetics now. We are able to control it in various ways. And the, and the world is on fire in neuromuscular disease. So we've already got treatments that have been approved, as you know, for uh, Duchenne, as well as for spinal muscular atrophy. Uh, for ALS, a treatment was recently approved that also used that antisense approach. And there are many, 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 many different uh, uh, approaches that are in development. So it's very, very exciting time. We can't do it without you. So what can you do? We, being here is part of it. So I really am grateful to you for being here. And we'll try to do these on a somewhat regular basis so that we can maintain momentum and make sure that we're not getting into any bottlenecks. Support the patient organizations. Help us work with pharmaceutical companies. And we're eager to work with you uh, to see if we can't conquer uh, neuromuscular disease. Thank <laughs> you.